Inspired Session. This is Daphne. This is a common three-year-old that I just recently sold and we are working on um, working on our third month of training here. I just got a regular um, a, a, a medium twisted snaffle in her uh, so that we can uh, work on so I don't have to pull quite so hard with my shoulders because that takes quite a bit of strength. Uh, she's a slight, she gets a little distracted so I, I categorize her in a slight ADD <laughs> um, category right now but that's more just because of lack of exposure and she's a little, she wants to check out her friends and somebody's leaving right now and she thinks that's rather unfair so anyhow uh, she figures anything they do I should be able to do <laughs> um, but we're just going to warm up a little bit we're going to break this up into about three sessions uh, this beginning part is a little bit more warm up so you get to see right now, what we're working on with this mare is her top line. Top line, and then we just started working on a little bit of rock back so that we can start getting her to sit back on her butt a little bit more. She started out being a little bit uh, springy behind, or as I call it, poppy, uh, where she puts, uh, she, she's going along, but she's popping her back end, lifting that. And then she also is a bridally type horse. Uh, she likes to come way behind vertical. That's just her from the beginning. So what I'm doing is I'm just keeping her in the middle because she's also a little squirmy. <laughs> so she's got squirminess, she's got a little bit of bridal and she's got um, poppiness in the back end. So I just try and create some walls along the sides that create a, uh, equal pressure on both sides of her mouth so that she can feel it. Put it this way, if you were bowling and she was bowling ball and your hands or reins were the, the bumpers in the bumper bowling, because obviously that's the kind of bowling I'm looking for. I don't need any gutter action. I need bumpers and the gutters. So anyhow, she is the ball. The, the narrower the lane, the, the straighter your ball is going to go. So we're going to pretend that we got a lane that's only, what is she, probably about six inches across <laughs> in her neck. And uh, your reins need to be uh, square coming off of her mouth. They have to put equal pressure on both sides so that it, and, and you got to ride deep through the saddle. I always look at my saddle horn for the most part as being my access point, which gives me depth that takes me back to the butt and the hindquarters rather than when you ride up front and you ride up in this area, now they have the opportunity to leak out their shoulder either way. But if you ride back here, now you've gained control of the entire body from mouth to, to tail. Now it can be a little harder to ride that way because a lot of people will tend to set their hands and ride, um, ride off of their hips. But the problem with that is your hips and the, the, the horse's face and the horse's body ride at two different um, points in the stride. So if you ride attached to your hips for balance and for, um, say, uh, steadiness of hand, that would be the biggest reason why people would set their hands, would be to gain steadiness of the hands. Problem with that is when you gain the steadiness off of your hips, you are actually bumping their face um, incorrectly and it becomes a, a, a battle that the horse finds unfair and, um, and doesn't appreciate that. So then you're causing undue stress and frustration in which then it goes to you and then that's when you have to be either severely mellow um, or you're going to lose your temper. Now you can see that she's warming up a little bit. She's uh, you know, testing out that um, top line a little bit and where to be. What I'm looking for for top line and to help get her onto the bit so that she'll nose out to it a little bit is I'm, I'm trying to get the highest point on her neckline to go to level with the withers or slightly below. And I have to take her there otherwise she stops right about here in the top line and all that's going to do is create more bundle up in the neck. But if you take her far enough down to break the highest point. Don't look at the pole. Look at the highest point, the crest point of the neck. That is the key that a lot of people are missing in their training process is they are going only three quarters of the way and that allows the horse to stay hollow in their top line or in their back 
and it also tends to make them bridle up and they'll either end up looking like a wall, like they're pushing a wall, uh, just like a billy goat trying to test out his horns, you know, or, um, it, it, yeah, they just, they won't ever finish out and get that nice flat top line. So that's what I'm working on. When I'm touching her, I might put a little bit of bump of the calves on her or whatever, because I want her belly to lift up as well, um, because eventually this is going to turn into a cue in which when I ask her for something, she also lifts her tummy up, uh, well I can go with more leg instead of hand. Right now it's a combination. When I first started it was a little more f hand than leg, because she had the plenty of motivation as far as an um, engine goes uh, to keep going forward and so rather than keep inspiring her to go faster generate more energy I ended up doing the um, I, I backed off the legs but when the engine started slowing down and I needed a little more oomph from behind then I started increasing the amount of leg and backing off the amount of hand so and that means that they're getting it figured out more and more big thing is making sure you ride square in your saddle. Sit nice and straight. Bring the horse to you. If you're sitting there trying to compensate, um, your horse is going to try and compensate also to get underneath you and carry your weight properly. Keep in mind, when you're riding, the straighter you ride, the easier it is for your horse to carry you in a more um, balanced, cadenced way. The more crooked you ride, the harder it is, which is an obvious thing. But now put it into kind of a scenario imagine trying to give somebody a piggyback ride and they're just heavy enough that their weight can throw you off if they're uh, moving their head a little bit or doing stuff like that so try imagine some carrying somebody that's twice your weight and uh, giving them a piggyback ride and all of a sudden they decide to throw their hand up and point at something and go oh by the way look at that and they and you just about fall out from underneath you because they ended up doing that because just a little bit of movement can make a difference in how how it affects you and your balance so just keep that in mind now I ride her without spurs uh, the last time I put spurs on um, she ended up getting me off luckily I was very graceful and landed on both feet uh, but that doesn't happen very often I think I can uh, you know, probably count on one hand the number of times I've landed like a cat, but <laughs> that was a lucky one, but it definitely gave me an adrenaline rush. So, I kind of took them back off, and I will introduce that at a later point. Right now, um, I don't feel that that's something, a bridge I want to cross at this point, until she gets a little farther trained, a little more settled. And, uh, and it's not really a necessary thing, I can use my little whip a little bit. So, and we'll have company come in here riding while we're riding also. But I use the whip just to help encourage, especially in point, at points when the, the foot seems to be something that she wants to brace against. And you can go ahead and go across. <laughs> So, because um, a lot of times what ends up happening is you'll find that I ride most of my horses either without spurs or with ball spurs. Uh, dependent on the horse's personality. My lazy ones I ride with ball spurs um, after they've gotten to a certain point in their training. What I have found is that um, horses that have come to me that were ridden with spurs, and not that spurs are a bad thing, I'm a spur rider too at times, um, but I believe that they're, I've come to understand that sometimes a lot of that extra drive, drive, drive that you think you have to put in there um, from with spurs is actually them bracing against and protecting themselves um, from your spur. And when I took the spur off, even though I thought, boy, this is crazy, this horse can't go without spurs, I actually found that I used a whip, and that was just a reinforcement issue. It wasn't, um, it wasn't what I used to motivate them. It just reinforced my foot. I actually found that they got lighter and lighter and they didn't need the spurs. What they were doing was they were holding their breath, bracing in their rib cage, which stiffened their back, which made them not be able to go forward. So anyhow, now that ends our warm-up session in which we found us just doing a lot of, you know, crossing over, making sure she sat back on her butt as she did it, making sure she kept her face straight. I don't want her just bending. I don't want her to put a joint in her shoulder where her neck and shoulder meet. 
I want her to sit back on her hock and I want her to just relax that neckline out. So anyhow, we are going to go to part two of our training session in which we'll do a combination of loping and long trotting. And we'll see you in a bit.